Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for this program hosted by the Brennan Center for Justice and NYU's Bradham, John Bradamus Center. My name is Ted Johnson, and I'm the director of the Fellows Program at the Brennan Center, and I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to speak with Cheryl Cashin about her new book, White Space, Black Hood, Opportunity Hoarding, and Segregation in the Age of Inequality. But before we get started, just a few housekeeping notes. First, we will leave time for questions at the end of this discussion. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please feel free to add them via the YouTube chat. And second, we provide live closed captioning. For those of you joining us for the first time, the Brennan Center is a nonpartisan law and policy institute that works to repair, revitalize, and when necessary, defend our systems of democracy and justice. Now for tonight's program, White Space, Black Hood, highlights a number of startling findings. Uh, the major takeaway is that with all that we know about the way the housing policy in the United States has discriminated against many, we often don't make the connections to the ways it impacts uh, equality in transportation, in our education system, uh, in police and law, enforce law enforcement, and even in the ways we buy homes and the housing values and the wealth accumulation that occurs there. Power and politics have redistributed resources from those who most need public goods to those with more than enough, hence resulting in an American residential caste system, a system that wields boundary maintenance, opportunity hoarding, and stereotype-driven surveillance. Early 20th century policy decisions have profoundly impacted current inequality. And what are the solutions? How do we change our perceptions of those in poor neighborhoods from presumed thug to presumed citizen? How can government change its relationship with these areas from punitive to caring? This is what we'll talk about tonight with our, our author, Cheryl Cashin. Cheryl is a professor at Georgetown Law and writes about race relations and inequality. In the Clinton White House, she worked as an advisor on urban and economic policy, particularly concerning community development in inner city neighborhoods. You may read her commentaries in the New York Times, the LA Times, and the Washington Post. In addition to White Space Black Hood, she is the author of Place Not Race, A New Vision of Opportunity in America, and Loving Interracial Intimacy in America and the Threat to White Supremacy. Cheryl, welcome. Thank you so much for being with us. Hi, Ted. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, so congratulations on a really good book. I was just telling you in the green room that I'd finished the book and then I've Look back, and there are so many places where I dog-eared and have my blue highlighter pin um, over these really interesting concepts and terms and ideas. So mm -hmm. I think the best place to start to give everyone a, 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 an introduction to your thesis is on this term residential caste, the, the idea of a residential caste. And I think from there, we'll be able to build out your argument some. Well, what I argue is that inequality in this country can only be explained by understanding the role of geography. Um, and residential caste, in a nutshell, as you said in the intro, we overinvest and exclude, the government does this, overinvest and exclude in affluent white, predominantly white space, and we disinvest and frankly prey on people particularly in high poverty black neighborhoods. And yet we, and we tell stories about the people in the hood to justify the way things are. Uh, and, and the biggest myth that I say we tell, uh, government tells, um, is that uh, high opportunity living is the earned result of, of striving, you know, it's earned. And that hood living is the, uh, the result of, bad individual behavior, uh, when in fact, nothing could be further from the truth. And you've already flagged the three primary anti-Black processes that undergird this system, boundary maintenance, opportunity hoarding, and stereotype-driven surveillance. And so we're all trapped in it, right? That This residential caste was created to um, contain the six million odd or more black people who fled the South seeking opportunity um, in the North and the West, um, contain them, cut them off in their from, from traditional investment, redline their neighborhoods. Uh, it was a system of social control. And eight decades on, we still have this system 
um, not everybody who's black is trapped in it, but everybody is trapped in this system of residential caste. Everybody who can't afford to buy their way into high opportunity neighborhoods that have the best of everything gets a different deal. And black and brown poor people trapped in concentrated poverty get the worst deal. Mm. So I'll tell you, um, a lot of conversation has happened in the last few years around concepts like redlining, things that policy folks have known forever, but that mm -hmm. the public is really just, has just really come into the public conscience because of writing um, for folks like you and ta Coates and talking about reparations, et cetera, The Color of Law, another good book. And so, but that redlining was sort of early 20th century policy activity. Right. And there's a sense that, well, wait a minute, Civil Rights Act of 64, Voting Rights Act of 65, Fair Housing Act of 68, the mm -hmm. Housing and Urban Development, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, I thought we'd addressed some of the very racist policies that created the wealth gap with this uh, progressive um, civil rights policies that were supposed to begin closing the gap or at least ameliorate some of the discrimination folks face. And what right. you show in your book, early in the book, is that even though um, the Kerner Commission in the 60s identified racism as the primary driver of inequality in, in this country, um, that the solutions tried to do everything but address the racism. Uh, and so I'd love to hear, just have you talk us through why it was that, that HUD and that the Fair Housing Act of 68 didn't accomplish the things that, that folks were, were, were demanding um, in terms of housing equality in that era. Right. So the Fair Housing Act of 68, which frankly passed only because uh, Martin Luther King was assassinated, right? right. And the, the, the DC was up in flames and the National Guard was surrounding the Capitol. That was the context it took for some um, moderate Republicans to cross the aisle um, and, and support passing this law. And, you know, the law um, was weak from the beginning. Um, it, but it, it provided an anti-discrimination remedy. Individuals could sue, um, but individual lawsuits aren't uh, up to the task of dismantling a systemic system yeah. that was decades in the making, right? The, the law also said that recipients of government funds have a duty to affirmatively further fair housing. But, you know, the only HUD secretary that ever really put pressure on affluent white suburbs to do that was Mitt Romney's father. And he lost his job over it, right? We're threatened to withhold funding from them if they didn't uh, affirmably further fair housing. And, and straight through 60s, 70s, 80s, HUD was a defendant in lawsuit after lawsuit where civil rights lawyers proved that HUD was acquiescing in and participating in the affirmative segregation, segregative policies. HUD was the sponsor of building public housing and, and, and you know, it, it acquiesced in local governments, building public housing and intentionally assigning blacks and whites to separate and equal um, projects, right? Um, HUD was investing in, uh, and to this day, invests in segregation and poverty concentration. Um, HUD, uh, and I mean, distributes about five and a half billion dollars annually just through its community development block grants. You know, the free, flexible money that mayors love. Um, and it does that to about a thousand cities every year. And it's never really had any accountability for using that money in a way that promotes inclusion. So the federal government is the one that taught um, um everybody who participates in housing markets to see black people as risky, as neighbors, to see them as hazardous. It taught redlining to the industries and it, and it followed policies straight through the 20th century that concentrated poverty. And that, that reinforced the feelings of, of, of avoiding black people. And, and, you know, we also have a lot of, um, local culpability um, in disinvesting in and devaluing black neighborhoods, you know, from roads to sewers to everything else. And so the distress, 
let me let me just underscore, you know, H O L C uh, marks black neighborhoods. Virtually every majority black neighborhood in this country, with rare exception, as hazardous in the 30s. Marks it with a D, right? Um, and uh, cuts black neighborhoods out of all of the, um, you know, mortgages, um, subsidized mortgages, but all of the major wealth building programs that the federal government sponsors, right? Um, so that's part of the black wife wealth gap. But, you know, the, there's a recent Fed study which shows that eight decades on, you can go back to the very same neighborhoods that were marked as red and see uh, distress and segregation to this day, which correlates with that major decision. So HUD has never really broken out of its initial sponsoring and encouraging of segregation, right? The Obama administration was the first, uh, first administration to actually roll out a rule that says you must affirmatively for the fair housing. And of course, you know, people who follow this, um, the Trump administration repealed it um, and he bragged about repealing it. And now, you know, the Biden administration is, is trying to reinstate it. But there's no consensus in this country about um, the federal government um, needing to atone for its sins in instituting, institutionalizing, and continuing to invest in segregation. Hmm. And so I wonder if you could give us a, just a, a, a quick overview of this rule, affirmatively furthering fair housing, right. and, and how that rule either helps an administration that cares about it, desegregates um, housing, or um, I think it was Ben Carson who was head of HUD when, when Trump sort of ignored it. Uh, and, and, you know, probably not by accident to have a black man who grew up in the projects to say this rule was discriminatory as a way of shielding one from the the, the uh, accusations of being intolerant of uh, on, on race and housing. But, but this rule seems really central to the good that can come from the executive branch through HUD based on and, and address some of our housing issues. So I um, can you just describe for us what the rule is and how it works? Well, I, I, I can't get into the weeds of it, but um, what I will say about it is that, you know, the Obama, as, as the Obama administration wrote it and promoted it, they wanted it to be a partnership where the federal government gave cities um, a lot of technical assistance and help and encouragement um, a lot of mayors actually didn't even know about the the, the obligation to affirmatively freight further. But um, it was, you know, a lot of positive help to say, OK, going forward now, it's not enough to just assess impediments. You actually have to look at what you're doing on the ground and see what you can do to affirmatively further. Right. Um, and then, you know, there was the veiled threat, like, OK, and if you ultimately don't do it, with, after, despite all this help of all this technical assistance, this mapping technology and all this stuff, then, yes, you you could potentially use lose housing funds if you don't comply. Right. Mm -hmm. And quite a few um, cities uh, had started to implement the rule when. Um, Secretary Carson and <laughs> President Trump repealed it. Right. Um, and, and, you know, I'll just leave my facial expression. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> so I'll say one of my, uh, it's, I should, I hate to say it's my favorite chapter because it describes something so insidious, uh -huh. but it was, I, I loved it because of how insightful it was and how language was racialized and then deployed mm -hmm. to communicate areas where black people were without saying that's where black people live and to communicate abuse in the system without saying black people are abusing the system. And you use these words, how ghetto sort of comes to be an inner city and welfare queen. So can you talk about the role of, of language and how that was used to further housing uh, segregation and racial discrimination? Right, that's chapter four. You did your homework. I did my homework. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't put it down, it was a good book. Yeah, thank you for saying that. Um, well, okay. so. Uh, you notice I start the book with a prologue, which has language 
from beginning with Thomas Jefferson right through to Donald Trump, right? Mm. And um, part of what I'm saying is, okay, this each time this country seemed to have abolished a black subordinating institution, slavery, Jim Crow, it created another one, right? And um, you could say mass incarceration, the iconic ghetto. I, when I use that word, I use it as a descriptor. Technically a ghetto is a place where 40% or more of the people in the neighborhood live in poverty, right? But systems of oppression, and I don't care you know, what system it is, there's always a mythology uh, and rhetoric used to justify the institution and bring others to conscript non-elite people into supporting the institution, right? And most institutions of dominance, particularly anti-Black ones, um, uh, confer unearned, unearned wealth on affluent elite people, right? So when it comes to the iconic Black ghetto, um, I, I, you know, the, the main participants in the dog whistling and negative Black stereotyping um, have been presidents and presidential aspirants, the main people who participate in stereotyping Black neighborhoods. And so you've already said them. And these these will be familiar to any observers of politics from law and order to uh, uh, the word ghetto itself became a purgative to welfare crane with Ronald Reagan, super predator, frankly, with the Clintons, um, who I work for. Right. <laughs> uh, uh, thug, you know, and you know, I mean, in the most vulgarly transparent president who's participated in this since um, George Wallace, and uh, I would say who was an aspirant, is Donald Trump, right? I mean, every time he got into a, a, a tweet war or a, you know, attacked a black, uh, uh, a, a city with a lot of black people in it, or a, a, a black congressperson, congressman, you know, he, um, uh, he would refer to, why don't you go back to your infested? He said it almost always. Inner city, he would say infested, you know, rat infested, violent infested, um, you know, and and yes, he would call, um, I mean, Obama did it too, but people who um, rose up after some black man was killed, you know, uh, invariably people would call him thugs. But Trump was... On, I'd never seen this in, in, I started paying attention to politics. I'm dating myself in 68, right? That's the first, you know, presidential uh, election I paid attention to. But I'd never seen a US president do this. He tweets the summer of 2020 when we have all this social protest going on about Black Lives Matter, you know, uh, he tweets, uh, you know, about the affirmatively further fair housing rule and says, you can thank me you know, for protecting your suburban dream and your, your, you'll be insulated from crime, you know, and you'll be, your housing prices will go. Basically, he was violating the Fair Housing Act of 68 in doing this and basically saying, you know, my policy is segregation. And he, and he marketed himself to suburbanites. Thank God the majority, uh, the, many of them, most of them didn't vote for him, but he marketed themselves himself as a protector for them against their, you know, invasion of their way of life and, you know, the violent people, you know, protesting in the cities. So, I mean, and this demonization of black people in poor neighborhoods has been really central, a central part of the rhetoric that's part of our anti-tax fanaticism, our, you know, small government fanaticism, the idea that, you know, it's over five decades, luring people to the idea that government is just about handouts for those people and not potentially a force for good. And that, in the, whoever controls the narrative in any policy debate controls the outcome. So, you know, presidential caste, stereotyping is a huge part of it. Um, did that answer your question? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so I want to talk. It's really interesting. And I, I remember you, you pulled out um, the things that 
President Trump said about Elijah Cummings in Baltimore being dirty, rat infested, and used the same language when talking about John Lewis's district in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And and just as you were talking there, it reminded me of the part where you where Trump is is saying the suburbs. I'm going to protect the suburbs. Right. And then it, it connects to another um, thing you show around boundary maintenance or, or frankly, boundary creation mm -hmm. through the interstate system. And right. so the interstate, as you point out, kind of becomes the highway for white flight to the suburbs mm -hmm. to suggest the suburbs is that's where white America lived. And mm -hmm. the inner cities or the ghettos is where black America lived. And the interstate, in some instances, was was um, the boundary between the two and and its construction often destroyed or further concentrated uh, Black poverty in, in, in the cities. So can you talk about this idea of boundary maintenance and the, the I guess, how they're created and sort of how they uh, perpetuate this other idea you talk about of opportunity hoarding? Okay, so I, do, I don't want to bore the audience. And by the way, thank I want to thank every one of you for tuning in. I know there's so much virtual content. I would you know, so you joining me, I really appreciate you taking the time and listening to me. So um, boundary maintenance consists of any intentional effort to create or maintain a racialized physical order. Now, you know, uh, The Color of Law is a run by Richard Rothstein is a runaway bestseller. I'd love some of that mojo, right? <laughs> but he focuses mainly on the policies that created ghettos in the first place, you know, from racially restrictive covenant, covenants, redlining, um, all of that history is there, right? Less familiar is um, the continued uh, present day stuff to maintain boundaries, right? But yes, to, so to your point, and these policies are cumulative, but the main four major policies in of the 20th century, exclusionary zoning, um, something like in, in many major cities, as much as 75% of the land is zoned such that it's illegal to build anything other than a detached single family home, right? And high opportunity places um, tend to be just that. And it's, you know, uh, you can like, you can wall out any population that can't afford a very large house on a very large lot. You can do that by just using your zoning code to exclude even market rate apartments. And a lot of high opportunity spaces do that. So exclusionary zoning, um, urban renewal, you know, we, we basically, the federal government basically cleansed downtowns of, 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 of black people, moved them out, and a lot of them were moved into public housing assigned on a discriminatory basis. So that's what really concentrated poverty and created iconic ghettos with high rises with notorious names like Cabrini Green or, you know, mm -hmm. who would I go all that. And then the other big policy, as you mentioned, was there's, you know, the, the um, making mortgages in the suburbs available only to whites, that's the redlining, but then the highways, right? The highways, invariably in any city where you look at where the major interstates were run and they were run through the most politically marginal uh, populations neighborhoods. So it was either black or white ethnic, whoever had the least power. But in the South in particular, the, the highway engineers were, were cruel about it. Like they would, they would run these highways through even vital neighborhoods, right? Destroy economic power right? Um, destroy homes, right? And so Black neighborhoods have been subjected to cumulative trauma of intentional policies sponsored by the federal government, right? Um, but today, what are some, you know, exclusionary zoning is still there. Um, the low-income housing tax credit, This our, we funnel about $10 billion a year for low-income housing construction. Uh, only a fraction of that gets built in high opportunity neighborhoods. So we're spending money or doing tax credits to concentrate poverty. And then you also have a lot of, you know, realtors still engage in, in racial steering. It's been proven in audits, right? Um, you know, there's discrimination. And, and 
the decision whether to be uh, aggressive about enforcing anti-discrimination law makes a difference. Republican administrations tend to retreat from enforcing any discrimination laws. You know, Democrats lawyer back up and try. But um, it's so difficult once an, uh, uh, a structure has been institutionalized, um, it, it tends to just keep perpetuating itself. And then there's constituencies supporting it. And, and a big message of my book is that poverty free high opportunity neighborhoods could not exist without intentionally concentrated poverty elsewhere right mm -hmm. that's the flip side of those policies right and it's so easy for people to believe that they're rising on the benefits of their own effort but what a lot of people don't realize and i i don't know if i've said this before in this interview correct me if i haven't if i have so i'm not uh, blathering on, but the people excluded from high opportunity space, which is the majority of, you know, it's virtually the majority of everybody, um, the majority of the population, they are subsidizing those places, right? With their tax, the golden infrastructure you see in high opportunity spaces um, um, is subsidized with, you know, Essential workers are paying those gas taxes, their, their sales taxes, their, you know, high opportunity places get more than their fair share. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, lots of Americans would like to think that we live in a meritocracy. And as you said, if you believe that, then the folks that live in poverty free zones with high opportunity earn their way there. Mm -hmm. And the folks that live in concentrated poverty areas with not a lot of amenities and, and sort of in these walled off areas, it's a deficiency in personal behavior or bad mm -hmm. choices. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what I love, uh, one of the things I love about the book is the way you sort of unpack how policy got us here. But then you put flesh and bone on the impacts of that policy by introducing us to characters, including your family, uh, going back several generations all the way up to today. So I wonder if you could um, sort of talk through the story. One, the one that moved me um, was of Lakia in Lakia D.C. Right. and how her struggles just to get housing um, is sort of uh, is representative of how convoluted and complicated our, our policy system has become. So even those who do believe in hard work can't manage to, to get their way into secure, safe housing in a poverty free zone. OK, so I'll thank you for this question. All right. I call the people trapped in high poverty, uh, the black people trapped in high poverty neighborhoods, descendants. Uh, in recognition of unbroken continuum. I never know whether to look at camera, look at you, whatever. <laughs> right. um, in recognition of the unbroken continuum from slavery to Jim Crow to, to the ghetto, right? The people who are trapped in the hood, and this is multi-generational now, I guarantee you, if you did a DNA <laughs> test, right, right, that you they would go straight back to the 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 enslaved because you know they they're they're you know, the descendants of slaves went north and whatever, you, you, you get the point, right? So it's an honorific and a term of love. Um, but, and I, and I, but I also um, say anybody who's a descendant of the enslavement, this includes myself, right, is a descendant, right? And black American descendants of slavery in this country, the singular defining uh, part of our experience is segregation and housing, right? Mm -hmm. um, you cannot understand it in any way. All right, now, so that's the first, and I and I, what I try to do is humanize my people, whom I love, and, and see as, as assets capable of anything if given the chance. I humanize them by starting every chapter with a descendant, right? And like I said, I include my, my great-grandmother, um, in it, but Lakia Barnett, who is my favorite um, um, bio, because I, I spent a lot of time with her. She was a client of George, where Georgetown Law, where I teach, has a wonderful health law clinic that was housed in a homeless shelter. And Lakia Barnett, who's a married woman with three children, 
uh, her who had been middle class, but through a series of unfortunate events, her and her husband both losing their jobs, found themselves homeless, living in a homeless shelter. Right. Um, and she was a client of, of and, and our our students helped her get, uh, among other things, a housing voucher. Right. And it is illegal in Washington, D.C. to discriminate against people based on their source of income. Right. So and this woman had gumption. Right. She 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 did not. She's the opposite of all the stereotypes. Right. She you know, she's an author. She you know, she has her own radio show. She was in the homeless shelter, like uh, organizing theater and dance groups and, you know, just a go getter. Right. And so she got miraculously because of her two, one of her children had a special needs. She got this voucher where there's like a 40,000 uh, oh waiting list. So it's a miracle even to get a voucher from HUD. Right. It's the, the people, you, there's a lot more demand for it than you can actually, than, than the, this government is willing to fund. But she, um, I show the Kafka S battle she had. She went to a high opportunity neighborhood, found a place. The woman initially said she'd take the take take the voucher, when, and then the woman backed off. Um, and you only get like three months or something to to get your placement. She almost lost out, but it was through a, a lot of help from um, our students. She finally found a place that would take the voucher. Where is it? In one of the most high poverty. Uh, neighborhoods um, in Ward 8, where she's 10 minutes away from gun violence, right? Um, and so I show, the, here's the point, right? I show in that chapter, starting with her story, you have to be superhuman to overcome all of the systems set against you if you live in a high poverty neighborhood, particularly if you are Black, right? From crappy, underfunded schools with the least experienced teachers to you know being in a food desert to being in you know the 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 heat it's like in the summer it's like 10 20 degrees hotter there's less green space there's you know not healthy food there's gun violence um there's often it's very hard transportation wise you're far away from you're in the opposite corridor from where the jobs are you know it could take two, three bus changes, you know, it could take you an hour to an hour and a half to get to a job, right? Dearth of every, you know, so, and then, um, you know, affluent parents spend a ridiculous amount of money eliminating every conceivable disadvantage that their child might face, right? You know, that's what this society, and sometimes they just straight up cheat. That's what the cheating scandal, um, that varsity cheating scandal is, is about. Right. But this society lectures to people where you have to be superhuman. Um, we will have overcome when people you can just be human rather than superhuman. And people understand that it's not surprising that people who are in concentrated disadvantage uh, sometimes fall down and don't make it. Right. So I try to show just how hard it is. And I def I. I I dare anyone who's listening to me to go and try to live there. You know, anyone who can get out gets the hell out. Right. 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 But it's it's these systems set against people in high poverty places are from government sponsored policies. And, you know, you see how animated I'm getting just even talking about it. Right. I'm I, I have I'm come from a civil rights family in Alabama. Mm -hmm. Right. You know. Um, I was taught to care about people who have less than me, right? And I decided, damn it, I'm going to be a voice for the people who are trapped in this system. But I'm also going to shine a light on how people, you know, some people are getting way too much. Right. <laughs> um, okay, very good. Uh, we have some audience questions uh, starting to come in. But please, if you have a question, you can use the YouTube chat function to send your question in. Um, a couple of the initial questions are, are exactly what they thought I thought they would be. And mm -hmm. they center on gentrification. Right. And I, I want to pair that with the, the, the one of the questions is, um, how do we address gentrification of areas once identified in red line mapping? And um, also, what is the role of nimbyism 
and like preventing people from or, or cities or, or states from expanding the amount of affordable housing that people can afford if gentrification is, is causing the cost of housing to rise in the most desirable areas. So let me take the gentrification thing first. So mm -hmm. um, I feature in, in the last chapter of my book, which is entitled uh, Abolition and Repair. Um, I feature some cities are doing um, what they called land banking, where they actually transfer land to a trusted community institution to be sure there's some housing that's always there in, and, and always affordable. And um, as people move through it, it gets returned to the community organization, but it ensures that there's some collective ownership that and, and an organization that has the ability to house people and retain character in a neighborhood that may be rapidly changing, right? Mm -hmm. um, I don't profess to have expertise about um, how you prevent gentrification, but if you, um, I mean, this is what someone told me, uh, several people said, well, if you, yeah, I have, uh, I'm, I feature a, a community in Richmond, California that dramatically reduced gun violence, right? And then you reduce gun violence and what a lot of people will move into very black neighborhoods if they're safe, right? So you have to have policies in place to hold on to the affordable units you do have, but you also have to have policies that um, plan for inclusion as you go, right? And I, I advocate for and hold up examples of places that have mandatory inclusionary zoning ordinances so that any new development includes um, units that uh, very low income people can live in as well along with market rate units, right? You have to have the policies and the vision of what your inclusionary city is gonna look like. Now, this this is a segue to the nimbyism, right? Um, even in so-called liberal California, this Democrat-run California, right? They have a terrible problem uh, with how, uh, uh, homelessness. They have a terrible affordable housing crisis. It's mainly because of um, exclusionary zoning and the, the, the sacrosanct detached single family home neighborhoods, right? People who have their vested interest in that and they're like, you know, hell no, I'm not, I, I am going to fight uh, the California legislature's attempt to repeal single family zoning. Um, they, you know, they, they finally, after years of effort, um, have, opened up neighborhoods, single family neighborhoods to duplexes. That's as far as they were willing to go. NIMBYism, you know, the, it's not always an anti-Black story, um, but, uh, you know, it's not hard to find examples when there's a fight about inclusion. I feature one involving Houston. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's not hard to find examples when it comes to trying to integrate schools, high opportunity neighborhoods or schools, you see saw this with things that um, the outgoing mayor of New York tried uh, to open up highly selective high schools um, <laughs> to all comers, right? Um, it's not hard to find thinly veiled or sometimes very explicit coded rhetoric. That's really about, you know, people, some people uh, won't say it out loud, others will. But the stereotype that a lot of people carry in their head with low-income housing is the classic, nasty, anti-Black stereotypes. Mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 you know, that's what Trump did explicitly. You know, I've protected you from, from crime and, your, you know, all that. So right, right. it's really, really tough. Uh, this is an interesting question from someone in the audience. Um, and so it sounds like, housing integration, racial integration in housing is, you know, the most straightforward way to assure, ensure a more uh, equal or egalitarian uh, um, distribution of resources. And so the question is, is it better for Black people to move to white neighborhoods that often have better infrastructure, schools, 
or vice versa, where white people move into black neighborhoods that can all often lead to gentrification. Um, and so in, in the pursuit of integration, in which direction is uh, is is a is better for this this goal of, of a more egalitarian society? So I'm going to answer the question directly, but first I want to flag that in my prescription of abolition and repair, I focus first on prioritizing historically defunded black neighborhoods. They should be first in line for new infrastructure dollars. They should be first in line for CDBG money, you know, or you name the thing, but I cite studies which show that even in black run cities, black neighborhoods are getting, you know, white neighborhoods will get three and four times the public subsidies of black neighborhoods. Mm. So racial equity in the allocation of the resources that are being spent across cities, uh, I, 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 I argue for, right? While we're fighting the, the, the long battle for dismantling boundaries, all right? So what, as a black woman, you know, who has money, um, um, I live in a house where there's six degrees between me and my husband. We've got good jobs. We have choice, mm -hmm. right? And, and we're sophisticated enough to perceive and overcome any racial discrimination against us. Where do we choose to live? We chose, uh, we've lived in one of the two Two, both of the two stably integrated neighborhoods over the long history of integration, frankly, between blacks and Jews in Washington, D.C., Shepherd Park and now um, Crestwood, right? Um, that's the choice we made. Even though we could afford to move west of the park where, you you know, higher opportunity schools, um, we chose not to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I'm the mother of fraternal twin black boys, and I feel like this neighborhood, and according to Raj Chetty's research, we have chosen exactly the kind of neighborhood that does best by black boys. Mm -hmm. A neighborhood where there's low prejudice among the whites who are there and a high number of, of black fathers around, right? Um, okay. But, you know, I'm I'm privileged. Right. You know, I work to get there. But, you know, I have money. I have agency. I have choice. Right. Um, I do think that whatever people's choices are, um, uh, the state should not be over investing and encouraging only a certain type of, uh, you know, of of. of there's more demand for integrated housing than there actually is integrated housing to fill it. Right. 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 So the state needs to start affirmatively furthering. And, and I think they need to, this is what abolition and repairs are, really need to blow up this vision of a, a, a single family house with a yard mm -hmm. and a fence. Uh, one, it's not sustainable. It's not affordable. There are a lot of people who would prefer a walkable neighborhood and a, you know, a very small footprint, right? But right now, uh, we don't we don't build it, we don't zone it. You know, we resist. You know, I, there are people who would love to live in a micro house that you know that cost, you know, they they built themselves or or may have cost less than twenty thousand dollars, whatever. But do we allow that? No, we do, we discourage that kind of stuff. So I, I'm what I hope is that. You know, each this is your cult that you're interested in the term cultural dexterity mm -hmm. <laughs> okay which is a, a, a phrase i coined in my last book loving which is about the rise of interracial intimacy in this country but a culturally dexterous white person um sees the growing diversity in this country and accepts it if not celebrates it like you know is at least willing to enter the fray and engage with the fact of a multiracial politics. And at the, at the PTA meeting, you know, would say, would at least have an attitude as like, I don't necessarily get my way on everything, mm -hmm. but I, I, I welcome, I'll be part of this community and we'll work it out together. Right. You know, that's cultural dexterity. I am willing 
to do the work of pluralism and a, 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 a adjusting to a plethora of norms, right? You know, that's work that older whites are just not used to doing. They're used to being dominant. And, um, you know, this backlash we're seeing in this country is really, a, 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 a I think, born mainly of uh, particularly older whites who are not doing well with the loss of centrality of whiteness in American culture, and in politics. It's, you know, some of the, okay. But who, the people who are drawn to cities, um, first of all, they just, whether you like it or not, you have to get some cultural dexterity just to be uh, on the street and around a lot of different types of people, right? But I, each, each new generation in this country is more, is more diverse than the one before. And yeah. you look at their attitudes in the Pew studies, they are more open to difference because that's what they know, right? That is what they know. I don't wanna be Pollyannish about it, but I, I, I say this in, in, in the final chapter of Loving. We are gonna reach a tipping point um, in which it gets easier to form a powerful multiracial coalition that's a majority, particularly in cities. And I hold up examples of cities that are doing that now. Minneapolis repealed its single family zoning ordinance. It took you know, several years of educating people to understand how it was that they had such a dramatically segregated city. Um, but you know, when people started to get it and the, and the, and the uh, mutual harms, I mean, a lot of econ economists have shown that cities that are highly segregated do worse economically and their people do worse. Right? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. I, I've, I may have, I'm going on too long and we should yeah, get sure. oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. This is great. No, no. Uh, the, our next question actually touches on what you, you write about really throughout the book, but really in chapter nine, mm -hmm. um, throughout the book, you talk about the ways housing segregation impacts education. And you also talk about specifically in chapter nine about surveillance by the state. And mm -hmm. so the question is, how is housing segregation related to school segregation and the school to prison pipeline? Okay, so children are more segregated than adults, right? Uh, parents with children who have uh, the ability to exit are more likely to exit. You know, they feel a lot of pressure to go to the most, the highest opportunity neighborhood they can afford. So there's more sorting among families with children, right? So there's that. And then because the Supreme Court, um, signaled beginning in the 90s that it's time to get out of the business of policing school desegregation orders, public schools have returned to neighborhood assignment. Well, you know, we're actually getting worse. Um, we're For the largest 200 metro areas in the country, according to a recently released study by uh, the people at the Othering and Belonging Institute out in California, mm -hmm. um, Cities are more segregated, but the major vast majority of cities are, or metro areas are more segregated than they were uh, in the 90s. Okay. So if schools are replicating neighbor neighborhood segregation patterns, then, you know, surprise, surprise, we, we, we have very segregated schools, right? The majority of black kids in public schools, black and brown kids, is one. Uh, their experience is one where they're likely to be segregated and at least half of their peers are poor, right? The average existence for white and Asian kids is the opposite. Most of their peers are likely to be white, white and Asian, you can put together, and uh, only a minority, often a small minority of their peers are poor, okay? Those types, two types of schools are very different, right? And, you know, you could call these high poverty, very black schools, apartheid schools, right? Mm. Now, this is the relationship to the school to prison pipeline. The social distinctions that come naturally to people become much more efficient 
uh, and marked when you overlay geography. It's much more easier to other people when you can point to a neighborhood school, those people, mm -hmm. right? And um, as, it, as it is in policing, right? So first of all, we've criminalized blackness um, in many ways, right? You, you know, uh, black people do not use drugs more than white people. They use them about the same percentage. But the Supreme Court, through a series of, 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 of um, decisions, has made it very easy for police to say, well, in a high crime area, I can be more suspicious of people. It's you can. It's so easy to get away with, you know, stopping and frisking virtually every young black man you see in a high crime neighborhood. They're all suspicious when you have that lens, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, black children in high poverty areas just get marked, right? Everybody is presumed a thug, you know. People, you know, and then you have these. Uh, SROs, what do you call them? Se security resource officers, some euphemism for a, a police state, right? You know, I, I had this experience when I, I um, was asked to talk to some sophomores at a high poverty school uh, here in the district. And I was shocked when I went through there. It felt like I was entering a prison, right? It was like so many police, right? Um, and I asked the kids, how do they treat you? Not good, right? Um, there's no care, there's no love, mm. right? Um, and so you, there's predation, predation. Um, mm. And it, both on the streets and in the, and in the, uh, and, and in the high schools, right? And we yeah. see these videos, they just break your heart. You'll see a video, I think of the one where the, poor black teenager gets flipped in her chair by a, 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 a white man, you know, uh, a white policeman, so, you know, but it happens um, with all different colors of policemen, right? Um, you just start to, to in, and let me stop. <laughs> right. That's the connection. That's the connection. Right. Well, policing. It also, when you have community schools of abundance, and communities of abundance and direct horizontal competition for limited resources, you know, abundant places and schools win. Right, right. It's a vicious, vicious cycle. Uh, this is an interesting question. Um, it, it asks, it's, is there a difference between a caste system and a class system? Uh, and talking about housing, it seems like if you have money and you have choice, that's, that's more an issue of class than it is of caste, which we typically associate with um, with some sort of biological mark or race or something like that. Mm -hmm. So in, in the residential caste concept you unpack in the book, is that similar to very, very similar to class? Or is there something else happening here where class is subjugated to, to the residential caste concept writ large? So I use the word caste because it conveys the um, social stasis, right? Uh, the, the, the way in which we keep people at the bottom. Descendants from high poverty neighborhoods, um, I really think are at the bottom of the social order, right? So you, it's a caste system at the intersection. If you want to be honest about how caste operates in this country, we have, we replaced the pre-civil rights. We had a caste system that was just based on race and black people were at the bottom of it, right? You know, particularly with Jim Crow, right? Um, but now what we have, a caste system that's at the intersection of race, where you live and your economic status, right? And by caste system, I mean, that it's like the, the two most dominant types of neighborhoods the two most persistent types of neighborhoods over time are affluent, high poverty, I mean, low poverty, high opportunity neighborhoods that happen to be very white and concentrated poverty neighborhoods that happen to be very black and brown. Those are the most persistent and they're at the extremes of residential caste. There's stuff in between, but the point is it's getting harder to get into high opportunity space, and it's getting harder to get out of 
concentrated poverty. So mm. if you if you lost the neighborhood lottery when you were born, um, you grow up in the hood, exit is increasingly improbable, right? This is Raj Chetty's work shows this, right? Um, so I think we have a caste system in this country, but you can't understand it without understanding the role of geography. And I think just bandying about class, frankly, is often a, a way to distract from the truth. You know, oh, it's about class, right? Well, first of all, you know, uh, class systems aren't so great for the people who are born into a lower class, but we believe, or we used to have a myth about this country that this was the land of opportunity where you could rise up through hard work. And what I'm saying is hard work alone um, may not get you out, may not get you far in, right. in the system that we have. Um, so that, that, that's my answer. <laughs> Yeah. So we're almost at time, but we've got time for one more question. And frankly, this question is the one that has shown up most in the chat, which is why I wanted to save it for last, because it's, mm -hmm. it's probably about five or six of them that have all, are all asking the same thing. Mm -hmm. And it is basically, what can we do? Okay. Uh, at the local level, uh, housing advocates, what they should, what should they be arguing for? Mm -hmm. um, if, when we log off tonight and wake up tomorrow morning, how can we uh, make housing more fair and just in America? Well, it would help if you read the book. Yes, <laughs> I agree. I mean, yeah. I, 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 I it's so easy to critique what has been. I actually, because I'm a former policy wonk, I actually take the time <laughs> to lay it out. But the beauty is that once you understand residential caste and its processes and how it works, the prescription for moving forward becomes obvious, right? So you just do the opposite. You dismantle these anti-Black processes, right? Inclusion rather than exclusion, right? Mandatory inclusionary zoning ordinances, which some cities have, um, rather than exclusionary ordinances, right? Um, racial equity in funding rather than opportunity hoarding. Right. I give examples. Baltimore, Seattle, Minneapolis. These are cities which have laws on the books which require a neighborhood analysis in annual budgeting where you pay attention where are the dollars going and what's what can we do to make it more equitable. Right. This is what um, the Biden administration's racial equity executive order, which they put the formidable Susan Rice in charge of, mm -hmm. is about racial equity. Right. And then the third, stereotype driven surveillance. Right. Um, once you free yourself up from the lens of, you know, of, of, of thug, for example, mm -hmm. to, to seeing black people as three dimensional human beings who are assets, who are potential assets and worthy of, dare I say it, love. Right. It frees you up to focus on evidence based strategies that actually could be more effective and probably cheaper than systems of containment, mass incarceration, you know, policing the ghetto, containing people. And I give examples of, of, of strategies that have made a transformative difference in people's lives um, once you have that lens, right? So I, I try to show it is not hopeless. Right. There are equality innovators right now, you know, um, in cities. I have a lot of reason to be optimistic um, about what can be accomplished right now in some progressive cities. We still, you know, got to fight uh, voter suppression. We still got to fight all of these structures that, um, you know, frankly, the Republican Party is scared to death because they know they're on borrowed time with the changing demographics of this country. So they suppress, suppress, suppress. You know, we still have to fight that battle. But I'm optimistic about what can be accomplished as Black people are humanized. And, and you know, the, the, the uh, protest of last summer showed that there, there, you know, 20 million people in this country protested, raised signs saying Black Lives Matter. So I feel like the hardest part, at least in the Democratic column, 
um, we've crossed that bridge, right? I think it's a political non-starter in democratic politics to lead with the demonization of any group, mm -hmm. right? Um, that's, you know, that, and, and frankly, you know, the Democratic Party used to be the party of white supremacy, right? Um, so there's a lot to be excited about, uh, but you never get to stop fighting and organizing for the policies you care about. So, you know, I, I hope that if you read the, at least the final chapter of the book, um, you can see some concrete things that you can do mm. if you've got majority power in a particular right. context. Well, Cheryl Cashin, thank you so much for this wonderful conversation. Uh, we wish you the best of luck with your new book, White Space, Black Hood, Opportunity Hoarding and the Segregation in the Age of Inequality. And thanks to our audience for all your questions. I wish we had the time to answer all of them. Um, and thank you very much to today's partner, the N NYU's John Bradamus Center. I'm Ted Johnson, and a quick note from the Brennan Center before we let you go. Stay up to date on key issues impacting our democracy with weekly analysis and insight from the Brennan Center experts. Sign up for the briefing newsletter at brennancenter.org slash briefing. And the Brennan Center looks forward to seeing you at our next event on November 4th, the midterms, what to expect next November and beyond. Be sure to register at brennancenter.org slash events. Thank you all for coming out. Thank you again, Cheryl, for being with us and for supporting the work of the Brennan Center for Justice. Thank you so much and good night.